we talked about our, our acronym, WCWC, Women Connecting with Christ. And we started out looking at women, a woman, if you will, in the scripture, the word of God tells us to look at uh, a thing, to understand a thing, if you will. All of us were created by God. So who would be better able to tell us what our purpose is than God himself? So we look to the word of God to give us an understanding of who we are. Now, I mentioned the law of first mention. Uh, the law of first mention meaning that when something is first mentioned in the Bible, oftentimes in Genesis, where you'll find the first mention of most things, um, it gives us a clue. It gives us a hint, a direction, an understanding of what that purpose is for the thing that God created. So when we wanted to know what God created woman for. We looked at Genesis 2, 18 to 25. When God created woman, he, of course, put man asleep, took a rib out of him, and he fashioned a woman. The thing we zoomed in on is why he created the woman. Well, he created the woman for relationship. It was not good for a man to be alone, we pointed out. And that's why we have such an inclination toward relationship. Uh, if you are the typical woman, you're going to be very desirous of relationship. And that means that your desire is to see people connected, to keep harmony in relationship. You know, it's said that a man, basically, if he can eat and relieve himself, so to speak, um, have intimacy, then he's satisfied. You know, women want to talk about it. We want to go play. We want to hold hands. We want to do all that stuff that makes for a fuller relationship because that's what God created us for. Okay. So Eve's purpose was to fulfill, if you will, the need for Adam to have companionship. Um, he, he, I mean, God said she was suitable for him. Uh, somebody said, is it a sin not to be married? No. Paul talked about the fact that some have different gifts. So some have the gift of celibacy, and so they're able to focus on pleasing God, he said. Others, that's not their gifting, and God can grant us the blessing of having a mate that's suitable. But don't, how can I say it? Well, let me not get ahead of myself. It's not a sin not to be married. Okay, we looked at Galatians 3.28, and I want you to compare Genesis. When God created Adam and Eve, he told them to be fruitful, to multiply, to subdue the earth. He told them both. He didn't just speak that to Adam. And then, of course, we know the serpent came along, the sin was committed in the Garden of Eden, and then the, the, there was a disruption, if you will, in the order. But then if you go back and look at what Jesus did, he restored the order that God intended. And, and Galatians 3.28 told us that in Christ, there's neither male nor female, meaning that God is no respect of person and that he honors us both. And that's why, you know, in this day and age, unlike in generations before us, it's a very common thing for a woman, for example, to be a pastor or what have you. That was unheard of in years past. But as we come into the body of Christ and, and the fullness of what the word has taught us in the New Testament, we know that even Paul's um, written examples, he talked about in the, uh, Romans chapter 15, 16, I believe it is, um, about apostles, you know, one who was a woman in particular, who he said taught him. So when, when uh, people, it's chapter 16, when people look at women, oftentimes um, they are interpreting the scripture sometimes in a way that says, oh, a woman can't lead, but that's not scripture. The prophetess Anna was in the, in the um, New Testament. There's all kinds of examples of women in scripture being used by God. Indeed, the very first person who saw him when he was resurrected from the grave was a woman. So I added this this week because the tension with us is this. Because we are primarily um, relational, because we have a desire to connect, we tend to be led by our emotions a little more than men are. And that's not to say that they're devoid of emotions. They are very emotional. They just tend to hold them in check better, um, hide them better, really. Uh, but we are emotional creatures by and large because we are built for relationship. We want to relate. We want to feel good about our interactions and so forth. But I want us to look at Proverbs 27, 7, because the Spirit of the Lord reminded me of this verse today 
and I just want to share it with you because in relationship, if you're not careful, you will compromise for a sake of relationship. Because of that strong urgence, that, that innate desire that God put in us to have relationship, if we're not careful, we will put up with, tolerate, um, allow people to treat us in ways that are not necessarily appropriate out of a sense of urgency. I don't want to say desperation, but sometimes we act like desperate housewives. And we allow ourselves to compromise for sake of relationship. And then, depending on how far we go with that, it can leave us feeling very shallow, very empty, and very used. In Proverbs 27, 7, it says, a satisfied soul loathes the honeycomb. What does that mean? When I'm satisfied, when I'm full, if you ever ate, eaten a good meal, maybe Thanksgiving, maybe Sunday, maybe anytime for real, because I like to eat a good meal, but eat a good meal, you're full, and somebody say, here, you want to pee? You can't, even if it's something good, you just like, I can't take another bite. I am stuffed. You know, the soul that's satisfied even hates honey. I can't take nothing sweet. I can't take nothing else. I'm satisfied. I'm full. But to a hungry soul, every bit of thing is sweet. So what does that say? When I'm starving, even if it's nasty, I'm so hungry, I'll take it. When you extrapolate the principle from that, if I'm not careful, I'm so hungry for relationship. I'm so desirous to be desired. I'm so uh, zealous to want to be with somebody that I'll compromise my standards for the sake of being with somebody. I'll qualify or myself as not as important, if you will, just because I just want to be with somebody. How many of us have been in relationships? Let's be honest. That we look back on and we know. I know I got a memory in my mind right now. And I look back and say, what was I thinking about? Was I doing that bad? Was, was times that hard? I mean, was I that desperate that I tolerated that? But at the time, it seemed like a good thing. My, my hungry soul took what was bitter and treated it like it was sweet. So I'm saying that all to this, all this say as a woman, you've got to be really guarded. You've got to be prayerful. You've got to use discretion. Somebody said, I can do bad all by myself. They don't need me getting with you to do bad if I can do bad all by myself. Sometimes I can even attest to the fact I worked at a woman's prison as a chaplain for 22 years. I went to an all women's college. I saw women come in in college, young women, beautiful young women, and before they left, they found themselves in uh, same-sex relationships. I saw the same thing in the prison. Now, some will say, well, I was born that way. But many of them are now married and have kids. Their desire and their desperation was so strong for relationship that they compromised what they knew to be right. There were people in the prison who had four kids. Baby, you ain't no homosexual. You got four kids. But because of her desire for relationship, she compromised herself in that context just so she would have companionship. And then she went home to her husband. Some of us are in situations now, I would dare say, that if we re really evaluate them, we have latched on to something bitter and made it sweet. And if you haven't, praise God, don't. But I say a lot more do than don't. Amen. So women were made for relationship. So we set out our endeavor here is women connecting with Christ. So we then begin to look at Christ. Who is Christ? Having a real relationship with God means that we have a relationship with his son, Jesus Christ. We looked at Romans 5, 6. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me go back there. Romans 5. Six. 
6 through 11. And it says, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood. What does that mean? We said it's just as if I never sinned. Because he died for my sins, God looks at me. At me. That's why we call ourselves and the scripture calls us saints. Even though we look at our lives and we know we're not perfect, God calls us a saint because he now sees the blood of Jesus having cleansed us and put us in a position, a right relationship with him and justifying us so God sees us just as if we never sinned. So his blood, <laughs> verse nine, much more than having not been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled we shall be saved by his life and not only that but we also rejoice in god through our lord jesus christ through whom we have now received the reconciliation because of his death we were justified he got up now we are right standing we too shall rise one day when we get uh, when we pass from this life but in the meanwhile we have now a right standing with god a righteousness through Christ Jesus. And we have been reconciled. Back before we were in Christ, our sins separated us from God. But Jesus brought us back together. He reconciled us and indeed gave us the ministry of reconciliation, the word of God says. So we saw in Romans 6.23 that the reason Jesus had to die is because the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So because we earn death, the wages of sin is death, Christ died in our place. He took our place. We don't have to die and go to hell because he took our place. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, meaning that once I accept Christ, I accept the free gift of eternal life salvation is a gift it's not something you can earn it's not something you deserve it's only because of the god that we serve loving us sending his only begotten son to die for us while we were still sinners and then when we say yes to him we then are translated from being a sinner to a saint now that messes some folks up because it's like well you still look the same you still do this and you still do that the process that God is taking us through is called sanctification. So where we start isn't where we're going to end up. Philippians 1 and 6 says, He who began this good work in you will see it through to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So the day you see me one way, 10 years from now, I'll be better. 10 years from now, I'll be better than this. I'm not what I want to be, but I'm not what I used to be. Matter of fact, I can have a shirt that says work in progress because God is not through with me yet. But in the spirit, I have already been decreed and declared a thing. So now my, my life got to catch up on the outside with whatever took place on the inside. Amen. And that's the process God takes us through. So we have to be patient with each other. Romans 3.23 tells us what? Among Bible scholars, y'all know this scripture. What's it say? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Nobody's righteous. No, not one. We all messed up. But because, again, Jesus died for our sins, we are saved through his faith, through faith in him. And then, uh, I'm not going to read the whole of Genesis 3. But you can go there and see. The temptation and the fall of man. We talked about it briefly a few minutes ago. We know that Eve was beguiled. She started talking to the serpent. And the word of God said Adam was right there. He didn't speak up. That's a whole other sermon. But Eve listened to the serpent, ended up eating of the tree that God told her not to eat of. Indeed, she even changed the word around. God said, don't eat of it. She said, he, he said, I can't even touch it. So having gotten beguiled, uh, confused and, and even deceived 
he ends up going along with this program. So because they are our spiritual ancestors, just like many of us have our ancestry back to Africa, and I am therefore of a certain bloodline because of my ancestry. Well, spiritually, you are of the bloodline of Adam because he was the only father there was. And out of him and Eve came all of mankind. And consequently, sin is in your DNA. Even as a child, you can't avoid it. It's in your DNA, spiritually. So once Christ came along and made himself available as a propitiation, as an offering for our sins, then we can all be saved through him. So we talked about how while we were without strength, God died, sent his son to die for us. Uh, in due time. Look at Romans 7, 8. Real quick. Some of y'all, this is review, praise God. And that's a good thing. Not long with revisiting the word. Some, this is Rhema. So we want to make sure everybody understands why we say we're connecting with Christ, because that's the avenue through which we can grow in God. Verse 8 says, but sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desires. For apart from the law, the sin was dead. So once we got introduced to the word of God, it told us and let us see where our sin was, so to speak. The sin is just in the flesh, and it's going to uh, be those desires going to ramp up and try to get me off course. You can read Paul said, what I don't want to do, verse in, verses one uh, in that same chapter, he said, what I don't want to do, I do. And what I do want to do, I don't do. Because there's sin in me. But thank be to God, it's the power of God that will break that grip of sin. And in due time, God did, uh, died for us. What is Galatians 4, 4 say? And again, if you have any questions, just post them in the um, chat so I, I'll be able to go. Amen. Galatians 4, 4. All right. I'm checking to see. We got folks. Oh, I didn't check my names here. Got folks from Belize. Praise God. Must be my sister Janet. New York, North Carolina, Chesapeake, welcome. Good to see you. Something, South Carolina, Houston, Texas, praise God. Hot Springs, Georgia. Good to see all you guys. Amen. Galatians 4 and 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive adoption as sons. So in that fullness of time, in due time, you can be going through some things sometimes and it feels like it's never going to change. But I'm telling you, there is a due season that comes in your life that when the fullness of time comes, God will deal with that thing and bring you to bring to pass whatever it is needs to happen in your life. And God, in the fullness of time, knew we needed a Savior because on our own, we would go straight to hell because the wages of sin is death. But thanks be to God, he didn't leave us on our own. So in the fullness of time, he sent his son, Jesus Christ. Somebody ought to say hallelujah and thank you for allowing me to be here. Because in the fullness of time, he died for my sins. Okay. And then it goes on to say, God demonstrates his love for us. And of course, John 3.16 is a very familiar text. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him may not shall not perish, but have everlasting life. What does that mean? He extends his love to us through his son. It's love that will cause somebody to die for you. There's no greater love than a man will lay down his life for his friend. And so what we're talking about, when we talk about connecting, we're talking about seeing Jesus as the connector. He's the means by which we can connect to God. So when we begin to go into this study, and this is just a brief overview. I did a very uh, much more detailed overview of this last year. You could probably pull it up on YouTube, as a matter of fact. 
under my class from last September, but I did a, con a full teaching on this whole concept of women connection, connecting with Christ. And the whole premise is that we are connecting with Christ so that we can connect and be a part of the kingdom of God, be a child of the most high God. And then all the promises of God apply to our lives because we connect with God through his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. So. So, connecting with God, connecting with Christ, rather. Who are we connecting with? We're connecting with God. What does John 1 and 1 say? Some of us know it by heart. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. So what does that mean? Jesus is God made manifest. That's why they called him Emmanuel, God with us. He is the word. If you could take the Bible and put it in a human form, what you would get is Jesus. So he was the fulfillment of the law, the word of God says. But he is God and he is the word manifest or, or living. He lived amongst us so that they could touch him, feel him, see him, and understand the word. He came to dwell amongst men. It's important to understand that because some Bibles, particularly the Jehovah's Witness Bibles, when you read it, it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was a God. It's got a little A in there. The devil is a liar. Why is that important? Because they take that G and make it a little G and say he was a God. In other words, he was not equal with God. And that's why the Jews killed him, because he said, who are you? they say, who are you that you would hold yourself up as being the son of God, as being equal with God? But he said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father, because we are one. And so it's important that you understand when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are putting our faith in God. He was the manifestation. It, 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 he was the, the means by which the spirit that is God took on flesh so that we could behold him and have a human relationship with him. Somebody said it like this, if I wanted to communicate with ants, what would I have to do? I'd have to become an ant so they can relate to me on their level. So God came down, if you will, to come and see about us, all right? So he is God, he is the word, he is God, he is God made flesh. And again, we read right there the same chapter, verse chapter, first chapter of John, verse 10 through 12, it says, he was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. So you have the opportunity and even need the right the privilege of becoming a child of God when you believe in the name of Jesus Christ. So he was God made flesh. And we know that he was not received. He was rejected. He was despised by his own. Those who you would think would have otherwise received him because they knew the, the prophets. They had the, the Old Testament. They, they were the chosen people of God, but they were the ones who rejected him the most because they didn't want to accept and he was who he said he was, even though all the scripture pointed to him. Some did come to know him, but many did not. And many even to this day reject him as king. And they still looking for their savior. That's why they uh, have the Seder dinner every year. They say the spirit of John the Baptist shows up. But God has already sent John the Baptist or the spirit of Elijah my son, has shown up. He's already sent him in the form of John the Baptist, but they're still looking for him. All right, so they did not know him. He came to the world, and they, though he made the world, look at that the world was made through him, and the world didn't know him. They were blinded by whatever their expectations. But those who did receive him, as many as believed on his name, have the right, they have become children of God. Any children of God out there? I got my hand up. Thank you, Jesus. All right. Isaiah 7, 14, what does that tell us? Isaiah 
Again, we just laying a foundation because somebody needs this. You might be one of those who say, well, I know that already. Praise God. That's a beautiful thing. I don't know about you, but I love to hear the story anyway. Isaiah 7, 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? God with us. So that's, that was one of the prophecies hundreds of years before he was born. Okay. He's the Lamb of God. John the Baptist gave witness to him. We know John and he were contemporaries. His mother, Elizabeth, was pregnant at the same time Mary was pregnant. He's six months older than his cousin, Jesus. And he was sent a, as a forerunner to foretell the coming Christ. And he said in John 1, 29, he said, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him, said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What a blessing. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, he takes away your sin. He takes all of your sin upon himself. So that's why God can see you now and not see sin, because that sin went upon Jesus Christ instead. So even now, one of the things we touched upon last week was forgiving, uh, being forgiven in Christ, and people who don't forgive themselves, people struggle with that. And I think later on, we'll talk about that not tonight, but I mean later in this uh, time when we're teaching, we'll do some teaching on forgiveness and on forgiving yourself. But suffice it to say, in God's eyes, you are no longer a sinner. Remember I said you are now a saint in his eyes. Why? Because Jesus took your sin upon him and gave you his righteousness. Ain't no better deal than that. You can't get a car at a better deal than that, a house at a better deal. There's no better deal in the universe than to give somebody your sin and take their righteousness. It don't get no better than that. And so God called Jesus the Lamb of God, the sacrificial lamb who died for every one of our sins and took away the sins of the whole world. But it requires, again, that we believe on him. Amen. He's the savior of the world. Right there in the same chapter, verse 29 says, well, I read 29, my bad. Luke 131 says, what does Luke 131 tell us? Luke 131 says, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. What does Jesus mean? Savior. He is our Savior. He's the one that saves us from sin and death. I talked about how like a man who falls overboard off of a big ship could be drowning and somebody can throw him a life preserver. It will only save him if he grabs it. It's not enough that he look at the life preserver or hang around other people with their life preservers. That ain't going to save him. He got to grab that life preserver for himself. It's not enough to come to church. It's not enough to go to Bible study. It's not enough to even know about Christ. Because guess what? The demons know his name and tremble. So you got to know Jesus for yourself. You got to have a relationship with him for yourself. You can't grind in on grandma's coattail. You can't. I used to be a, a chaplain at the prison. Women would come in and, and they would feel real proud and say, well, my mom's an evangelist. My pastor, my father's a pastor. My granddaddy's a pastor. That's all well and good. But what about you? Have you accepted Jesus? Do you know him for yourself? He's our savior, but it's up to us to take the savior, the saving grace. Ephesians 2.14 tells us he is our peace. You know, when God gives you something, his gifts and call are irrevocable. He gives us his peace in his son, Jesus Christ. He makes peace. Uh, one of the young men on my uh, website is living out in California. He's been a part of the wildfires that have been um, taking place. His family had to evacuate their home because of the wildfires, and he had to run, basically, you know, to save his life. He said they finally let him go back home, but there was no home to go back to. Everything was burned down, charred. But he said, I feel like I'm a witness for God. He said, because in spite of all that, I still got peace. I said, that's the power and the presence of God. When you can go through hell and high water and still have peace, 
That's the kind of God that we serve. That's who Jesus is. When you cast your care on him, he gives you a peace that surpasses all understanding. So Ephesians 2, 14 says, what? For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. Talking about the, the Jewish versus the Gentile community, how God made us one. No longer are we outsiders. We are part of the family of God once we give our heart to Christ. He is our peace. He gave us peace with God, peace with one another if we receive it in the spirit. But more profound is peace even within when all hell can be breaking loose on the outside. People can look at you and say, well, how you got peace with all that going on? Jesus, ain't no other basis. Jesus learning to call on his name, learning to rest in him, learning to receive his heart and his peace in my times of trouble, in my storms, he is my peace. And when you're not, this is, as Pastor likes to say, I didn't have this in my notes, but I'm gonna throw it in for free. This is not something that God will force you to have, but he will sure make it available. If you rest your soul in him, he can give you peace. I found the thing that keeps me from being at peace is here. It's thinking on and worrying on and fretting over stuff that ain't even happening. Stuff that could happen. Stuff that might happen. It's not even happening. And whatever is happening, God still got me. So when I sit there and think and worry myself and fret myself, then I disrupt the peace that gives that God has given me. But when I rest in him and say, I don't even understand what you're doing, God. I don't even understand what's going to happen in the future. But I know you got me and I know you got the future. So I'm going to rest in you. God will give you a peace. I'm a living testimony. I remember when I had miscarriage. I was fairly new in my marriage and um, got pregnant maybe, I don't know, four or five months after I got married, I had a miscarriage. Broke my heart. Really broke my heart. And I remember sitting one day and somebody sharing a word just to encourage me. But as I sat there and meditated on God, I mean, he literally shifted me from a place of downwardness to a place of peace. And when people saw me, I remember them kind of like whispering and even finally saying to me, well, how you got so much peace after all you've been through? All I can say is Jesus. When you know who you know, and you know he's got you, whatever he allows in your life, he will bring you through. All you got to do is rest in him and trust him. Think about a little kid. You take them somewhere, they hold your hand. They don't be crying, worrying, where you gonna go? Which street we gonna go across? Oh no, I don't know which way I'm going. They just smiling and happy, holding your hand. Wherever you go, they go peacefully. That's why we gotta become like them little children. God gives us his peace in Jesus Christ. Somebody ought to say amen. Bless the Lord. Amen. And then he's our high priest and our intercessor. These are all the benefits of connecting with Christ. This is probably one of my favorite scripture in all of scripture. If I could have a favorite scripture, this would certainly be on the list. Hebrews chapter four, because no matter what you're going through, you can turn to this scripture. I can turn to this scripture and find peace for my soul. Look at it. It says in Hebrews chapter four, verse 14, it says, sin then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. What does that mean? Don't get weary. Don't get uh, fretful. Don't worry. Hold on to your confession. He is your peace. He is your high priest. He is your uh, lamb. He is your God. Hold on to your confession. Verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. You know, sometimes I mess up and I'm like, Lord, forgive me. And I almost heard the Holy Spirit today kind of say, girl, we just laughing at you. You just got your little silly self into another little mess and we laugh and we love you like that. You ever got a little kid, they do something silly, you just laugh at them. You don't get mad, you just laugh at them because they did something so silly. God is not angry with you. God loves you. You his baby. You his boo. 
and he is empathizing, sympathizing with your weaknesses. We don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. That means every temptation you face, everything you go through, every struggle, he been there, done that. So he can understand. It's like a person who's had the disease that you had. When, they, when you encounter them, there's a knowing between you because you can describe what you've been through and they get it. I remember when I was a chaplain one time, this lady came into my office. She had a fairly complicated uh, case. She had been arrested on some conspiracy charges and it, it was kind of convoluted. But anyway, it took her a good 25, 30 minutes to explain it. And when she finished, I said, okay, I understand. And I explained everything back to her. And she was in shock because she had told so many people and they didn't get it. But what she didn't know is I'm a lawyer. So I got it. I could empathize. I could sympathize with her situation. I understood what she was going through. When you have a God who has walked the earth, who has been in every kind of temptation, who has experienced betrayal, who has experienced loss, who has experienced pain. He knows what you're going through. He's been rejected. He's been despised. Nothing that you're dealing with that he hasn't already done. And therefore, he's able to sympathize with us in our weakness. So what does he say? Because I get it. Come to me. Verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So whenever you're going through something, the last thing you want to do is run from God. It amazes me how people go through stuff and say, well, I ain't going to pray no more. I ain't going to this no more. Are you crazy? That's the place to run to. He understands. But that does not only, because there's a lot of people understand and they say, oh, I feel so bad for you. But check this out. He can not only understand, he got what you need. Look at it. You'll get mercy. What is mercy? Not giving us what we do deserve. We do deserve hell. We do deserve to get fired sometimes. We do deserve to get in situations and get in trouble. But God in his mercy holds back what we deserve. So he gives us mercy. Then on top of that, he gives us grace. He said, fine, grace. Now I'm going to give you what you don't deserve. God is so good. I held back the whooping you deserve. Now I'm going to give you the blessing you don't deserve. Grace is God's unmerited favor, unearned, don't deserve it. Ain't no reason you should have it. You know, and I know there's some blessings in our lives that we did not deserve, but for the grace of God. So God saying, come boldly to me. I understand when you're going through something, just come to me, I'll help you out. Whatever you need. You need mercy, I got that. You need grace, whatever you need, I got it. All of this is the package that we get when we connect with Christ. Amen. So I want to shift, because this is a word that I wanted to share last week. That was really just an intro foundation for our class to give you an idea of why we chose this topic, women connecting with Christ, and where we're going is um, applying the word, reading the word, meditating on different contexts uh, or, or circumstances within the word, but we'll look at them within the context of being women. So are there any questions? If so, throw them in the chat and we'll deal with them before I shift, because we're going to look at the book of Zechariah, Old Testament. If you start by uh, Malachi and turn backwards, might be a quick way to get there, or just go to the table of contents, ain't no shame in that, and he will be there. Okay. How you doing? Uh, it's quiet on the home front, praise God, no questions. So this is a word that, how are we doing? Okay, good. So go through this quickly because it's just a, it's a word that God blessed me with to encourage me one day in the midst of all this pandemic. And I decided that I wanted to share with you before we launch into our, our first series. And that is that God remembers. 
in the book of Zechariah, Zechariah, his name actually means Yahweh remembers. That means God has not forgotten about you. He remembers you. He's concerned about you. He is with you. I don't have questions. I don't see any questions. Let's see. Hmm. I don't see no questions. Let me go back and see if I see what you're talking about before I move forward. I see. That's oh, okay, my bad. I see it. Oh, the Ghana's family is with us. Praise God. So, ladies, we have a group of women in Ghana that join us each week. Um, last year we had women from Nigeria, but this year we have women from Ghana. So wave your hand, say hi to our Ghanaian sisters over there so they can see us. We love you and we welcome you to the team, family from Ghana. All right. Um, does women connecting with Christ have a ministry verse? Not per se. Um, I guess it would be an idea, but I've never adopted one as the, as the standard, if you will. Um, does the ministry have a scripture? I think I'll pray on that. Genesis, did you mention something about Genesis 3.28? Because, no, I didn't say Genesis 3.28. I just said chapter 3. I don't think I named the uh, verse. I don't think I did. Uh, it says, Jesus took away our sins, but aren't we required to ask for forgiveness for our sins? Yes, we, we ask forgiveness for our sins for sake of relationship. I mean, I'm sorry, of fellowship. I want you to think of it like this. Um, if you're in a relationship with someone, your best friend, let's say you accidentally hurt her feelings or you did something on purpose, you hurt her feelings. And you realize it caused a, a, a scene, you know, it caused some, some ill feelings between you. If that relationship means something to you, what are you going to do? You're going to go back and say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. It doesn't mean that you're no longer that person's friend. You still have a relationship, but your fellowship has been broken. If you have a child, I have two. Uh, when I gave birth to them, I loved them. They were the cutest things since sliced bread or apples or whatever you want to say. And then they started talking, Lord have mercy. And then the more they started talking, the more they started developing their own little attitudes and what have you. And then eventually it stopped being cute and it started being, wait a minute, don't be trying to get so smart. And so they might say something that I don't like and I might have to get in their grill. You know, every now and again, I get my daughter's face and say, you want a piece of me? She says, she thinks I'm crazy. Okay, I might be a little crazy. But anyway, when they do something I don't like, go to school, get in trouble, whatever it is, guess what? They're still my child, but I'm not pleased at that moment. So in other words, when I ask for forgiveness, I'm not asking so I can get saved all over again. I'm already saved. I already belong to God. But I'm asking so that that fellowship you know, my conscience will be cleansed that I haven't done something that offended God. So it's much, it's as much really for my sake than God's because the blood of Jesus has, has cleansed me. He gave his blood. He died. He shed his blood for every sin. Think about it. None of my sins had been committed when he died. So every sin was in the future. So every single thing I do that's dishonoring to God is already cleansed by the blood of Jesus. But my conscience, I have a sense of, of obligation and a, a, a sense of remorse when I know I've done something that's different, that offends God. So I'm going to ask him, Lord, please forgive me. But I'm not asking him to save me again. I'm already saved. A man can't be born again again. I can repent is what we call that. I turn from that thing and ask him to forgive us. Forgive me. Okay. What is the middle wall? I mentioned that the middle wall referring to in, in Ephesians 2.14. We had a Jewish community that was God's chosen people. 
Jesus was a Jew. He came because God initially gave them the Ten Commandments. Remember Moses went on the mountain, got the kid. He was in a relationship that was unique to them. When Jesus came, he went from dealing with just the Jews to whosoever would believe. So now Jesus is the uh, avenue, the conduit, the way, as he says, through which we can have a relationship with the Father. And he took us from being the Jews and the Gentiles to being one family in Christ. So that was the wall between us. We didn't have the law. It was unique to them. Okay. What is the middle? Tell me how to lie. What does it mean to let us hold fast our confession? I mentioned that already. We want to hold fast. In times of difficulties, some people start backpedaling. Well, I ain't, God ain't all, I ain't going to pray. I ain't going to read my Bible no more. I've seen people throw their Bibles away because God didn't answer the prayer they wanted. No, you got to hold fast. You got to be consistent. Hold firm. Mercy, again, is giving. Oh, pardon me, not getting, okay, let me give you an example. If I had an apartment or a mortgage payment that's due on the first every month, $500, because we know that don't exist these days, but let's pretend my bill is $500. It's due on the first. If I don't pay on the first, technically I am in default. They may give me what they call a grace period. So they might give me an extra five days. If you pay by the fifth, we ain't going to add no late fee. So that's grace. They're giving me something I don't deserve. What does God give us we don't deserve? Salvation, Jesus, forgiveness. We don't deserve none of that because we sin. Blessing us with material things, with good health. We don't deserve that because we deserve death. The wages of sin is death. But he gives us all this stuff. Everything beyond death is gravy. It's a gift. It's grace. So he gave me a five-day grace period. So now it's the fifth day, and I still haven't paid. Now he can go and file some papers and start working on getting me put out. But let's say the landlord comes to me and says, I don't want to put you out. How long will it take you to pay your rent? Legally, he had a right to put me out, start working on that process when I missed that deadline. But mercy says, I'm not going to give you what you deserve. I'm going to hold back. I'm going to give you another chance. Mercy covers you when you deserve hell in the grave, and he holds it back. Mercy covers you when you get in trouble and you know you busted, and God shows you mercy and don't allow them to treat you as your sins deserve. Mercy is you not getting what you do deserve. Grace is giving you something that you don't deserve. Amen. All right, so we'll pick up the rest of them afterwards. Praise God. All right, so that's the essence of, of that first part. And you can feel free to ask some more questions. I'll just add them at the end, which is getting to be pretty close. So I'll, I'll um, try to lay this before you, and then we'll wrap it up. This is Zechariah, the priest. Zechariah was a contemporary with the prophet Haggai. The prophet Haggai was a minister when the people of God had been in exile for 70 years. Jeremiah had told them because they kept messing up, God was going to allow King Nebuchadnezzar to take them away captive. He was going to allow them to have to be there. Uh, Daniel, you know, the book of Daniel, all that was when they were in back in uh, captivity. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they got thrown into that fire, fiery furnace, that was in captivity under the king Nebuchadnezzar. Now Darius has let them go. Nebuchadnezzar's off the scene. New king, he released them to go back, as God's word said he would. After 70 years, he said, I'm going to bring you back. Seven is the number of completion, we know. And so Zechariah and Haggai, if you read Zechariah 1 and Haggai 1, 1, you'll see they were started writing like two months apart. So they're contemporary. They're coming back to a time where things are desolate. They were 
the economy was shot. You know, they've been in bondage for all these years. There was a few people around, but the, the crops were all messed up. The, the uh, temple was messed up, had been burned up. I mean, it was just a horrible scene. Things weren't looking good. Kind of like what we're dealing with right now. So they came back to that. His name, as I said, means Yahweh remembers. He was a contemporary with Haggai, and they were returning from exile. So I'm going to walk through this. First thing that God says, because this is so parallel to where we are right now. That's why I say I believe it's a word for us while we're in this pandemic. What God said to them was return to me. Look at it. In verse number two and three, it says, the Lord has been very angry with your fathers. Therefore say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. If you want to see God's blessings flowing again, he's saying, return to me. How many of us have gotten our eyes off of him doing all kinds of things? Our nations have done all kinds of things. We made all kinds of laws. He's saying, return to me. All right. He said, repent, verse 4. Do not be like your fathers to whom the former prophets preached, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, turn now from your evil ways and your evil deeds. But they did not hear nor heed me, says the Lord. How many warnings had he given them? But they didn't listen. So off to captivity they went. I don't know that God brought a pandemic, but I know God allowed a pandemic. I can't help but wonder. You know, some people say, well, how do we end up with President Trump? All I can say is, if you can't obey me, the word of God says, I'll send an unmerciless uh, official, which some see him as and some don't. Praise God. That's not my topic. My point is, when we don't honor God, sometimes we get what we don't want. And he says, repent. Don't be like your fathers. I sent them the word. God has spoken the word to us over and over and over. He said, repent, turn back to me. They didn't listen. Don't be like them. Then look at verses five and six. He gives us the reference. What is the reference? Showing us how it works out when you don't do it his way. They are an example. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? Yet surely my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants and prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? So they returned and said, just as the Lord of hosts determined to do us according to our ways and according to our deeds, so he has dealt with us. Everything he said and what happened came to pass. They said, remember those prophets? They said, oh, no, we're not going into captivity. And they put a Jeremiah in a pit because he said, you're going into captivity. They said, oh, no, that's not true. He lied. Well, the lying prophets ended up being the ones killed. God is going to do what his word says. Just like he said Jesus was coming, he also said he's coming again. He's going to fulfill his word. So we have to look at what they did and learn from them. Use them as a reference. If we are under his word, he will bless us. To the faithful, he shows himself faithful. Even now he's showing us mercy. Because it should have been a whole lot worse by God. So we know God's hand is upon us. They don't recognize. Verse 7, on the 24th of the day, day of the 11th month, which is the month of Shabbat, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo, the prophet. I saw by night, and behold, a man riding on a red horse, and it stood among the myrtle trees in the hollow, and behind him were horses red, saw, and white. Then I said, my Lord, what are these? So the angel who talked with me said to me, I will show you what they are. And verse 10, and the man who stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, these are the ones whom the Lord has sent to walk to and fro throughout the earth. So they answered the angel of the Lord who stood among the myrtle trees and said, we have walked to and fro throughout the earth and behold, all the earth is resting quiet. So these are angels that God sent about to check it out. What's going on with mankind? What are they doing? And know that they angel that they went back and reported to. Note that capital A. Who they're talking to? That's Jesus, what we call a pre-incarnate version, meaning before he put on flesh and came to earth. He, they went back and reported to him. Even now, the word of God said, there are angels amongst us, and we don't even know it. 
So that's why it said entertain strangers, because you might be entertaining a, 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 an angel. Show hospitality at all times. You don't know who you're dealing with. But he was checking us out. He's looking to see if there's one right. Anybody's going to do it my way. God is now saying, I'm amongst you. I'm sending my out amongst you. I'm observing who's going to honor me. Is what I hear the Spirit of the Lord saying. Look at verse 12. It says, The angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah against which you are angry these seven years? In other words, guys, yes, they messed up, Father. Yes, they didn't obey you. Yes, they didn't listen. How long, Father, before you're going to show them some mercy? And God did what his word said. He said, I'm, I'm going to relent. Because he said, after 70 years, I will give you an opportunity to come back and try it again. How many of us, after this pandemic, God, give me one more chance. <laughs> I want to get it right, Lord. I'm going to live right. I'm going to do whatever I need to do. Please take this pandemic away in the name of Jesus. In all seriousness, I believe this is a word to us saying, God is a merciful God. He won't allow this to go on forever. He is going to relent. When the angel spoke, God said, verse 13, well, I read verse Hebrews 4, 14, and 16 already. That's what I talked about, the high priest interceding for us. And this is Jesus doing the same, the pre-incarnate. And you can go back and read verse 7, 25 in Hebrews 4, I mean, I'm sorry, in Hebrews chapter 4, 14 and 16, we read already. You can go back and read chapter 7, verse 25. But the point is, he is the one who intercedes for us. Even now, the scripture says he lives to make intercession for the saints. And so God, the Father, in his great mercy, will not leave us in a situation like this forever. Thank you, Jesus. What did he say? Verse 13. And the Lord answered the angel who talked to me with good and comforting words. So the angel who spoke with me said to me, proclaim, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts. I am zealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with great zeal. I am exceedingly angry with the nations at ease. He was talking about those who used Nebuchadnezzar. He used nations to chasten Israel when they wouldn't do what he wanted them to do. But he said, I'm angry with them. He said, and they help, but with evil intent. Meaning they, I told them to, you know, chasten them, but they, they had a nasty heart and treated them even worse than I wanted them to. I'm believing God that this pandemic has done way more than in the name of Jesus we wanted to see happen. Or even he, of course, he is sovereign, so he knows what will happen. But I'm saying in the, in the spirit realm, I believe there's a fullness of time when God will say, okay, enough. Out of his mercy for us. So he says, I'm zealous for you. I love you, in other words. I'm concerned about you. Look at verse six, 16. Therefore, thus says the Lord. I am returning, thank you, Lord, to Jerusalem with mercy. That's a word for somebody right there. You feel like you're at the end of your wit. God is saying, I'm returning with mercy. I have not forgotten you. My house shall be built in it, he says, says the Lord of hosts. And a service line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. Again, proclaim, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, my city shall regain shall again spread out through prosperity. The Lord will again comfort Zion and will again teach Jerusalem. I believe that's a word for us, that right now our economy might look kind of funky. Situations might not look good in your situation, your life, your individual circumstances, but God saying, I remember you. And again, prosperity will come. Again, I will bless you. Again, there will be hustle and bustle in the cities. I'm not going to stay in this posture forever, I'm going to have mercy on you. So I want to encourage you with this word today because it encouraged me. Be reminded God remembers us. He has not forgotten about us. He has not forsaken us. He has not abandoned us. And our day is coming to be blessed and prosperous. So hold on. Put your hope in the Lord. Whatever you're going through right now, it ain't over. God is not finished with us yet. Amen. 
again, that was something that God had blessed me with when I was meditating during my quiet time one day. And I said, before I go further, I just wanted to share this word with you. Hold on, because God has not forgotten us. Yahweh remembers, and he is going to bless us again. All right? So, any questions? I know I answered several. I see what resources are good to have besides the Bible to understand the Bible better. You can get a good um, commentary, um, a number of, or a good study Bible even. A number of people have written study Bibles breaking down the word. Um, Tony Evans, Pastor Anthony Tony Evans comes through our church every year, preaches all over the world. Excuse me, he just did a commentary and a Bible, study Bible. Those are very good resources. Some people love Joyce Myers' Bible. I like her Bible. Some people are not Joyce Myers' Bible, but if you enjoy her teaching, she has an excellent uh, Bible, study Bible, because it has all the notes in the, in the um, bottom and the, and the references in the center, all that kind of thing. The other thing is a good commentary. A commentary will help you um, break down different parts of scripture. And you can start out with a small one because, you know, you can spend thousands of dollars on a good commentary. I would say start with a small one, maybe like a Matthew Henry. He has one that you can get either one with like a complete one in one book or if you want a multi-set, I think he has a six, seven book set. But you can get them, like I have one that has about 20, 30 books. Um, Barclay is a very famous one, but it's kind of expensive. Somebody bless me with it but it breaks down every, uh, every one of the uh, books of the Bible, okay? Um, let's see. I think, let's see, do I see any more questions? <clears throat> Excuse me. How do you relate God's word? Oh, let's see. What was the scripture you referenced when you spoke about our current executive or something? Oh, a, a merciless official. I'll tell you, I want to say the Proverbs. Let me look at 17. How do you relate God's word in these scriptures to the 200,000 who have died? As I said, I don't believe God bought the pandemic, but I believe he allowed it. What does that mean? Some things we bring upon ourselves when we make decisions, you know, and there's some theories about how this thing was created in the first place and some kind of uh, experiment gone bad because there's a university near the city where it broke out in China. And supposedly it was some kind of medical experiment and, got out and da, da, da. I don't know all that to be true. All I'm saying is that's one of the things I've heard. My husband works in medical research and that's what his understanding is. The point I'm making is when God allows a thing, he allows it for a reason, I believe. Um, but I don't believe he initiated evil by any means. But if he allowed it, then he will use it for his glory. He'll use it to God cause us to turn back to him. Anytime he allows tragedy, he'll use it for us to, our hearts to be pricked to come back to him again. Um, let's see. How do you lay God's word description? So, I mean, that's pretty much my take on it. I mean, I believe he allowed it to get our attention, to, to let us know that we're moving in the wrong direction. Um, and his mercy is not more than it has been. Because if you go back and remember, they were saying we would have had this number way back months ago. But by the grace of God, we only just hit 200,000. And I don't mean to belittle that because there's no small numbers. But imagine if it had been 500,000, even closer to a million people. By the grace of God, it's not worse. But yes, I, I do believe he allowed it. You know, I don't believe it's his desire that we... Um, suffer, but I believe when he allows it, he uses it to get our attention. Um, 
for the Bible study from last week. You can look on whosoeverbelieves.org, whosoeverbelieves.org, and look on the videos, and you'll see the Bible study posted every week. So if you ever miss a Bible study, you can always go on there and catch the last one, or they'll all be on there. And people come in and look at, I have, we have visitors literally from all over the world that come and look at our videos. So that's always available. Um, I'm not familiar with open Bible commentary. Somebody asked about open Bible commentary. You may want to check that out. Um, oh, open Bible as a commentary. I'm just not familiar with it, so I can't speak to that. And I believe a 17-year-old can attend. I'm not X-rated. I try to keep it pretty clean. But you do use your judgment. It's women connecting with Christ. So, I mean, I try to speak to women issues, but I don't get into the the gritty, nitty gritty. So I think they would be safe. You know, 17 is pretty mature. Um, I think that's it. Okay. So, double check. We did those. Okay. So, next, we want to give everybody an opportunity to know Christ. We believe that every time the word of God goes forward, he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. It means that somebody probably feels a nudge in your heart. You feel like God is calling you to get closer to him. And we want to give you that opportunity. So I want you to look at what God or listen to what God is speaking. You feel him pulling at you. That's him saying, I love you. I gave my son for you. I want to have a relationship with you. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you would like to be saved today, I want you to type your name in the chat. Just type it right in there and say, I want to give my life to Christ. If you never accepted Jesus, today is the day of salvation. You know, tomorrow is not promised. Somebody went to bed last night, didn't get up this morning. I got on the phone just before I got on in the class. A girlfriend of mine's son had surgery, and we were talking about it. Her son is in his 30s. And some other friends of ours had surgery the same week and they're all doing fairly well. Even though it's a slow recovery, we like praise God. Because another person who was his same age had surgery, which seemed like a mild surgery, wasn't even an intense one, quote unquote. He started feeling bad the next day and died. I'm not saying that to say be afraid, but I'm saying that to say is be ready because we don't know the day or the hour when God will call our name. So if you've never accepted Jesus as your savior, today is the day of salvation. Type your name in the chat and say, yes, I want to receive Christ. The next thing I want to say to you, if you have accepted Christ, but you're backslidden, that means you used to work with God, you accepted him, but now you know you're not doing it God's way. You want to get back in a good relationship, right relationship. Get rid of everything and, and repent. Type your name in there and say, I want to rededicate. Just type it in the chat. I want to rededicate my life to Christ. Finally, or not finally. Next, if you have questions, like I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure I do know Christ. I'm not sure if I am ready, if my day gets, uh, comes. I'm not sure I am ready to receive Christ as my Savior. I'm not sure I'm ready to face judgment. I don't know what will happen to me. If you're not sure, type your name, say, I'm not sure. And that's legit. I had to do that. I went up front when they did the altar call. I'm not sure. Even after I had done it the week before and I heard the lady explain, I just wasn't sure. I had to go back again and get it straight so I could be sure. God wants you to be sure. And then lastly, if you want to join First Baptist Church Glen Arden and become a member here, we would love to have you. If that's your desire, type your name and say, I want to be a member. Just type it right in the chat. I want to be a member. I want to join First Baptist Church Glen Arden. We would love to have you. It's a great place. It's an honor. God is honored here. God uses Pastor Jenkins and others to bless us. It is a great place to grow in the Lord. I'm trying to tell you, I'm so grateful I came here. And when I joined, I was a seasoned saint. I had been with the Lord a long time, but I've grown tremendously being here. 
because God really uses him. So I invite you, if you don't know Christ, if you want to accept him, put your name down and say, I want to accept Jesus. You backslidden, you had accepted him, but you got another step, put your name down and say, I backslidden, I want to rededicate my life to Christ. If you have questions, you're not sure, and you want to get clarity, put your name down and say, I'm not sure. Or if you want to join the, uh, the church, First Baptist Church of Glenard, put your name down and say, I want to join. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. So, praise God. Hopefully everybody has indicated their desire. They want to join, they want to uh, rededicate whatever. You put your name down so we can see it. Amen. Now, um, praise God. I also want to challenge you to do one little thing for me. I know you put it in the chat, but honestly, this would make me feel better each week as well. Shoot me an email and tell me what you put in the chat if you put your name down. Send it to RevLettyCar at gmail.com. It's on your um, registration, RevLettyCar at gmail.com. And just say, hey, I've already dedicated, or I'm giving my heart to Christ, or I'm not sure, or I'm joining, whatever it is, shoot me an email just so I can make sure I have all that information accurate. I would love for you to do that and put your phone number because we want to actually be able to follow up with you. Put your name, your phone number, and what your decision was. Okay? Praise God. All minds and hearts are clear. Again, that's my email. You can use it. RevLadyCar at gmail.com to let me know your decision. And finally, we're going to close out with a word of prayer. Um, I didn't emphasize it the, this, the, today, but as I shared last week, anytime you have prayer requests, you can do uh, this by, I mean, you can share it by putting it in the chat. We have a chaplain, uh, Margaret Butler, who will pray, and the rest of us are prayer warriors. We will be praying. She's been sharing names and, and information. People have been posting it in the um, WCWC chat on our website, or even there's a prayer wall on the website. You feed the post there. All of those are means by which we can join you in prayer. The beauty about the prayer wall is literally people check it from all over the world and pray for us. So we've seen God move in a whole lot of situations whole lot of situations. And we praise God for that. 